This park, therefore, is in the largest sense a work of conservation. It was just so heartbreaking. You felt like you were leaving your soul up there. It was a gift to future generations. It was the culmination of a dream to bring the National Park experience to millions of Americans within a day's drive of the Blue Ridge Mountains. This gift did not come without sacrifice. The people who lived in these mountains sacrificed their land, homes, and sometimes their history. The Blue Ridge Mountains form the eastern front range of the Appalachians. The eastern slope meets the rolling foothills of the Piedmont, which flows gently toward the Atlantic coastal plain. The western slope bounds the fertile Shenandoah Valley. The Blue Ridge is crowned by a well-worn single crest rising more than 4,000 feet with offshooting branching ridges separated by deep hollows. American Indians hunted and gathered food here for over 10,000 years before their contact with the first European traders and settlers. The settlers who came to the Tidewater area of Virginia did not expand past the Piedmont for the first 100 years, but as population increased, they looked westward. The first settlers moved to the rich soils of the bottomlands in the valley and the Piedmont. By 1750, the next generation was moving into the lower hollows of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Each subsequent generation was forced to either move upward on the mountains into narrower areas of tillable land, to move to towns, or ever westward toward the frontier. The explosion of railroad construction, especially in the West after the Civil War, generated an endless need for timber. Commercial logging interests bought major tracks in the mountains, and laborers cut and hauled timber for the railroad ties that would span the nation. Mountain families also grazed cattle and hogs on rocky upland slopes, developed water-powered sawmills and gristmills on swift-flowing mountain streams established inns, stores, and taverns on the Cross Mountain Roads, cut bark for the leather tanning industry, and harvested chestnuts and apples for sale in the cities to the east. Life was characterized by hard work, strong family ties, and good neighbors. One of America's most beautiful and phenomenal wilderness areas, Yellowstone in 1872 was the first area set aside as a national park based on the idea of preserving special places. The national park movement grew both as a philosophical concept and as a practical economic movement driven by railroads attempting to develop their vast land holdings in the West. This early tourism in the Western parks was limited to the wealthy. With a shorter work week and a booming economy, the 1920s gave many Americans more free time and more discretionary money. The burgeoning automobile industry was changing how Americans saw their country. The idea of creating large natural parks in the East, where a majority of the population resided, had strong support from many quarters. Stephen Mather, the first National Park Service director, realized that for national parks to have broad support, they needed to be accessible to all Americans. State and local governments and chambers of commerce 
saw tourism bringing in tax revenue to be used for road development, a critical need in the motor age in the rural south. Mather pitched the Eastern National Park idea to Secretary of Interior Hubert Work, who appointed a committee to investigate possible sites in 1924. The Southern Appalachian National Park Committee members met several times at Skyland with the various park supporters. Skyland had been developed by George Freeman Pollock and his wife, Addie Naren Pollock, on a tract of land in the Blue Ridge Mountains as a retreat and playground for professional and moderately well-to-do patrons from the Atlantic seaboard. By the late 1920s, the Skyland Resort consisted of a central dining hall with over 40 privately owned rustic cabins and numerous trails on several thousand acres of land. After considering the merits of different locations, the committee recommended two eastern mountain parks, one in the Great Smoky Mountains and Shenandoah National Park in the Blue Ridge Mountains, centered around the Skyland Resort. The committee's report also recommended the construction of a scenic roadway along the crest of the mountains. The federal legislation formally authorizing Shenandoah National Park was passed by Congress and signed by President Calvin Coolidge in May of 1926. But it devolved upon the Commonwealth of Virginia to obtain the land and donate it to the federal government. Although Western Parks had been established on public land, Shenandoah National Park was to be created from privately owned land. A newly formed State Commission on Conservation and Development solicited private donations and committed monies to purchase land for the park. But its venture depended foremost on local landowners and residents who would soon have to sacrifice homes, livelihoods, and communities. In 1928, Herbert Hoover was elected president. Aware of Hoover's fondness for fishing, the chairman of the Virginia Commission on Conservation and Development invited the president and his wife Lou to visit the area of the proposed park. Enjoying the clear streams and brook trout, Hoover was hooked. They purchased the land and Lou Henry Hoover designed a summer retreat, Rapidan Camp. Celebrities and reporters followed the president's fishing forays and publicized the beauty and grandeur of the Blue Ridge and the idea of a national park. In 1930, at the height of the Great Depression, Virginians were hit by an epidemic of hog cholera and the worst drought in a hundred years. Seeing the desperate conditions, President Hoover supported an earlier idea, a scenic roadway along the Blue Ridge. In 1931, he assured that drought relief funds were obtained for local men with hand tools, eventually alongside contractors with heavy equipment to construct a road from Rapidan Camp to Skyland, the first step toward a skyline drive. The developing park's proximity to Washington, D.C. made it a convenient and highly visible testing ground for Depression-era work relief programs. Following his inauguration in 1933, one of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's first acts was establishment of the Civilian Conservation Corps. Camps were set up in the Blue Ridge Mountains for unemployed young men from families on relief. In exchange for their work, the CCC boys received food, clothing, shelter, medical care, and $30 a month pay, 25 of which was sent home to help support their families. The CCC program was a great success, and Roosevelt used every opportunity to broadcast that message. The creation of Shenandoah National Park spanned three political administrations and more than 10 years. During that time, 
the concept of what a national park should be changed. The Hoover administration had no problems with the development of extensive recreational facilities within the park and were willing to allow mountain residents to remain in the park as long as they did not impede development. But later, the Roosevelt administration reversed this earlier philosophy and mandated that all residents had to be removed. This change threw the lives of the nearly 450 families still living in the park area into turmoil. Although the people have long since left the mountain, images, voices, and signs of their former presence and sacrifice remain. My father and my grandfather went somewhere and they came back and said, well, we're gonna have to go. They're not gonna let us stay. And they talked about trying to fight the government to see if they couldn't keep their land and stay. But then they decided you can't fight the government. It's no use to try. And they weren't squatters. They bought their land. We had deeds for them. We really thought because they'd give you a little hope, you know, that, well, we're not going to move you out. You can stay here. And you'd think, well, good, we won't have to go. Everyone was so disturbed and upset. that That was the topic of conversation continually from morning till night, as if anybody was awake, that was all they talked about. They're going to make us go. When we started trying to pack up everything and get it on the trucks, and oh, it was just so heartbreaking. You felt like you were leaving your soul up there. And even now, I see that mountain, and I feel like it's belongs to me, or I belong to the mountain. On July 3, 1936, President Roosevelt spoke at the dedication of Shenandoah National Park. This park, therefore, together with its many sisters that are coming to completion in every part of our land, is in the largest sense a work of conservation. We seek to pass on to our children a richer land and a stronger nation. And so, my friends, I now take great pleasure in dedicating Shenandoah National Park, of dedicating it to this and to succeeding generations of Americans for the recreation and for the recreation which we find here. And so it is that citizens of this country and the world now have the good fortune to enjoy the blessings and restorative powers of this beautiful place, made special by the foresight, dedication, and sacrifice of those people who previously passed this way.